All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on evolution with a specific focus on testable predictions. This debate is between Kent Hoven and Tom Jump, and this is a continuation of our 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge Series. This is the much anticipated rematch between Kent and Tom as they debated several months ago uh, in this same Evolution Debate Challenge Series. So we've done about 30 or so of these uh, you know, this year with, of course, many more to come. And so if you love debates, you love lectures, you love interviews, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and share around this content as we do believe uh, critical thinking is incredibly important, which is exactly why we, we host so many uh, debates on a variety of important topics. All right, well, before we get into the opening statements, let's kind of break the ice a little bit, uh, get to know the debaters, although you know both Tom and Kent are certainly no strangers to the debate world. Uh, Tom, let's start with you. How you been? A little bit about yourself, a little bit about your channel. Uh, yeah, I'm Tom. I'm a professional mannequin. I, I do mannequin work. I sit in a chair and I pretend to be a mannequin all day. That is that is my occupation. Not bad, not bad. Appreciate that. Um, Kent, let's hand it over to you. How you doing? A little bit about yourself, a little bit about Dow. Well, thank you, sir. Kent Hovind, I've uh, been a Baptist preacher 48 years, taught science in high school 15 years, love the Lord, want to teach the Bible. We have Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. It's all free. Come take a visit and you'll enjoy yourself. Can't beat it. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, appreciate it. Short and sweet introductions. For the audience sake, I'm going to go over the uh, format. It's going to be relatively the same format that we've been doing in terms of this series. Lots of discussion going point by point, topic by topic. Now, before we do get into the discussion, we are going to kind of have, you know, 10 to 12 minute opening statements just to lay the foundation for tonight's topic. Tonight's topic, again, being evolution but with a very specific focus on testable predictions. Um, for the audience sake as well, we're going to have, as always, uh, an audience Q&A. So please just make sure you're uh, tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss them. All right, well, we're going to hand it over to uh, Tom. And again, we've got 10 to 12 minutes for an opening statement. Tom, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, so I, I have a video that was conveniently made for me by uh, Jackson Wheat. So if you could just play the video, it'd be great. All right, here we go. I am going to, uh, in order to play the video, let me just start the timer. I am going to mute myself so there's no echo at all. So you won't be able to hear me, but you'll be able to hear the, the video. So here we go. Let me get the video going that Tom sent. Um... <laughs> All right. So I'll say, since I'm sharing the video from my end, anybody in the chat, maybe just wait until the opening statements are done to send me questions because I won't be able to uh, play the video from my end and save questions at the same time. So save those awesome questions of yours until the opening statements are done. Here we go. Hello everyone, we've talked a lot on this channel about how evolution is used to understand the past, but today we're going to talk about how evolution can be used to predict the future. So, let's jump right in. As we've mentioned on this channel before, the hallmark of a good theory is its ability to make predictions. Anyone can make up an ad hoc rationalization to explain away data that contradicts a particular model, but not every model can be used to make accurate predictions about future data. If the evolution of all organisms from a set of common ancestors is true, then we should be able to test that. As it happens, we can. We can test it in numerous ways, with morphology, ecology, biogeography, genetics, and with fossils. So, let's take some examples. 
Darwin himself provided numerous predictions. One of the most famous was the prediction of a pollinating insect that possessed a proboscis with an absurd length that could reach down inside the flower of a peculiar species of orchid from Madagascar that held its nectar deep inside a long tube. This insect was eventually found, a moth called Xanthopan. Darwin also observed that the bones inside the wings of birds looked like they were fingers that got fused together. So he predicted that a fossil of an ancient bird with separate fingers would be found one day. This ended up being Archaeopteryx. The first specimen was discovered just two years after the publication of Darwin's book on the origin of species. But the evolutionary predictions didn't end there. An example of a modern prediction of evolution is one we have discussed at length, the chromosome 2 fusion, including all its details such as the telomeric repeats at the fusion site, two centromeres, one of which is deactivated, as well as the conserved centony between chromosome 2 and the two that remain separate in the other great apes, which can only be predicted based on common descent. Not only was the fusion predicted, but creationists have been completely unable to refute it, but since we already made a video about that, we're going to leave it there. The prevalence of mutations in organisms even allows researchers to make predictions about their prevalence in populations. For example, there are different types of mutations, such as mutations from guanine to thymine or from cytosine to adenine, etc. These mutations occur at different rates in the human population, so are found at different frequencies. Using these frequencies, we can generate a graph like this, showing the signature of mutations. If mutations were also the cause of interspecies genetic differences, then we would predict a similar spectrum graph when counting up the different types of nucleotide differences between humans and chimps. And we do. In fact, the spectrum also matches when you look at the differences between humans and more distantly related apes like gorillas and orangutans, and matches when comparing differences between those other apes such as chimps and gorillas. This makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model. Under creationism, it implies that a creator created interspecies DNA differences that just so happened to look exactly as though they had occurred by the same natural processes that give rise to within-species differences. It also makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model why genetic sequences for homologous proteins converge the further you go back in time, which was, by the way, also predicted under evolution. When we reconstruct ancestral sequences from different groups of species, we find that those ancestral sequences are more similar to one another than the descendant species, implying a branching pattern of divergence that fits the evolutionary model of common descent perfectly. Researchers also sometimes make predictions about specific genetic homologies in organisms. Michael Coates wrote the 2003 The Evolution of Paired Fins, when he specifically notes the homologies between scapulocoracoid or pectoral fin cartilage and certain branchial or gill arch cartilage. His abstract ends with this, quote, No transformation of arch to girdle is necessarily implied, but some signal of developmental relatedness is predicted, close quote. And, sure enough, the 2009 paper, Shared Developmental Mechanisms, Pattern the Vertebrate Gill Arch and Paired Fin Skeleton by Gillis, Don, and Shubin, found, quote, the molecular patterning of chondrichthyan branchial rays, gill rays, and reveal profound developmental similarities between gill rays and vertebrate appendages, close quote. Another example of a very precise prediction concerns our yolk, or rather lack thereof. As all amniotes, our embryonic development is typified by the formation of several membranes, among them the amnion, hence the name. These membranes retain the moisture for the embryo, which allowed amniotes to invade dry land. Most amniotes lay eggs that contains a massive yolk sac filled with nutrients, which allowed for the development to be more complete before birth, without the need for a post-birth metamorphosis stage as is the case with amphibians. Egg laying is the ancestral reproductive state of amniotes, and there are still a few mammals around that do this, like the monotremes. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete, but curiously we still have a vestigial yolk sac that doesn't have any yolk in it. All of this points to the conclusion that our ancestors once laid eggs containing a yolk sac filled with yolk. And yolk is mostly protein coated by genes. So if eutherians are descended from amniotes that once laid eggs with yolk, we should expect to see leftovers of these genes in our genome, and we do. They are broken, but they are still there, and when compared to their functional homologs and other amniotes, they also have the same neighboring genes. 
This is called shared sentiny, which is also a predicted phenomenon as a direct consequence of common descent. Aside from genetic predictions, evolution also makes fossil predictions. First, Robert Broom predicted the existence of an amniote with a double hinged jaw joint based on the idea that mammals evolved from the colloquially called reptiles. The jaw joint of ancestral amniotes is formed by the articulation between the articular and quadrate bones, while that of mammals is between the dentary and squamosal. Broom deduced that the only plausible way for this transition to have happened is that, at one point, both jaw joints were together at the same time, and this was discovered decades later in Probane Ignathus and a whole host of other near-mammal fossils. William Beebe predicted that birds should have gone through a stage in their evolution where they had asymmetrical flight feathers on their front and back legs. He predicted this by the fact that Archaeopteryx had sparse flight feathers on its hind legs, which weren't enough to be useful for flight, so he thought they were vestigial, indicating that an ancestral stage with bigger feathers on the hind limbs existed. This was found in the form of Microraptor. Also in relation to birds, a feather morphotype was predicted by embryological data and later found in dinosaurs, such as Bipiosaurus. Paleontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous, and that was confirmed as Sphecomirma. Neil Shubin and colleagues predicted a fish-like tetrapod or tetrapod-like fish, and at that stage would there be much difference, in Devonian strata of Canada, and that was confirmed as Tiktaalik. Researchers long predicted the existence of sauropods in the Triassic, and that was confirmed as Isanosaurus from Thailand. Recently, a semi-aquatic whale ancestor was found named Paragocetus. This cetacean has a flattened tail like a beaver, which was useful for propelling it through the water. It also showed how the earliest marine whales migrated from their place of origin near India to the Americas. Later whales, such as Basilosaurus, had tail flukes, while earlier whales, such as Pachycetus, had thinner tails that would not have been especially useful for swimming. Paragocetus fits in directly between these with the tail shape predicted by researchers. The list goes on, but the point is that there's no reason for these predictions to have been fulfilled if different clades of organisms were created separately from each other, as imagined both in the flood geology and intelligent design models. Then there's biogeography. Geologists have worked out that the crust of the Earth has changed much throughout its history and organisms have had to adapt to it. Regarding this, researchers correctly predicted that fossil marsupials would be found specifically in Eocene strata in Antarctica since they moved from South America to Australia at a time when these land masses were connected by Antarctica. The same is true for many dinosaurs and plants predicted for even earlier times based on what was alive in the then-adjacent land masses of the Mesozoic. So, what does all of this mean? It means that evolution works. It makes accurate, specific predictions about what should be found both in the fossil record and our own genomes. To quote young Earth creationist Todd Wood, quote, Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it, close quote. Or, to quote young Earth creationist Kurt Wise, quote, Evolutionary theory suggests that land plants evolved from marine green algae and that land animals evolved from marine fish. The first appearances of fish, amphibians, and reptiles, as well as the position of morphological intermediates between fish and amphibians, are in exactly the order predicted by evolution. Close quote. Thus, if evolution were supplanted by some new theory, that theory would necessarily have to take into account all of the successful predictions made by evolution. You cannot make a new theory by ignoring valid data from the old one. That old data must be built upon. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, perfect. So that covers a number of things that evolution predicted before we knew them, and then we discovered them later. And this is called a novel, testable prediction. Novel as in new not old, not the status quo, not things we already know, not things that are a pattern we've already known for a while. It's a change in the pattern, a unique and interesting change. That's what no novel means, unique, interesting change. So, for example, if some unnamed person were to predict that evolutionists won't discover something that we haven't yet discovered, that would not be a novel testable prediction. That would be a 
status quo prediction, something's already the case. So if you something's already the case, like the sun rises on a regular basis and you predict the sun will rise tomorrow, that is a status quo prediction, not a novel prediction. So just to be clear, when we're looking for novel predictions by creationism, not status quo predictions. All right, so I will, I will yield the mic. Um, that's got to be a debate first. Pizza and somebody else's video for an opening statement. So uh... <laughs> oh, I just want to say shout out to Jackson Weed. Everyone sub to Jackson Weed's channel. Uh, he makes great content. And he specifically made this video for me. Just happened to be like five years before we started the debate. So just, just didn't know that. He psychically predicted this was going to happen. And so he made that video specifically for me for this debate. Also a prediction made by Evolution. This was a future testable prediction. Jackson Wheat knew, you know, three to five years down the road, he himself would not want to take the evolution debate challenge, but he knew that Tom Jump would at least be brave enough. So this is good. Two on one. Uh, Kent, we've been looking for a two on one. So, okay, here we go. All jokes aside. Thank you, Tom. Uh, that was just over 12 minutes. So we're going to give Kent more time. Whenever you're ready, Kent, go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Yes, I didn't know I was debating him that tonight. I thought I was debating Tom, but that's okay. I'll take him on. Tell him to call. He can be debate, my debate number 300. I'll go through his little video and tear it apart frame by frame. Real easy to do. Everything he said is based on the assumption that we have billions of years. There isn't billions of years to work with. Now, I predict plants and animals will always bring forth after their kind. That's my prediction. Dogs will always make baby dogs. Cats will always make cats. Cows will always make cows. That's what we see in the present. That's what everybody predicts for the future. But you guys want to think, you say, if we go back in time, stop. You cannot go back in time. You can imagine that if you'd like, but you can't go back in time. And fossils don't count at all. Not a single fossil would count as evidence for evolution. You couldn't prove that fossil had any children, let alone different children. Dogs, wolves, coyotes, are they related? Probably so. <clears throat> American Kennel Association says there's 339 breeds of dogs. Well, God said they'd bring forth after their kind. And I'd say the breeds of dogs that we see, Chihuahua, Great Day, and everything in between, is still a dog. They brought forth after their kind or their sort. 20 times in the first seven chapters, the Bible says that'll happen. That's all we see. You might get a weird, you know, oddball looking dog, but it's going to be a dog. And I do this with four, four year olds all the time. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? They always get it. It's the banana. They bring forth after their kind. But I'd be willing to predict, Tom believes bananas are related to dogs, if you go back in time, far enough, okay? I believe, Tom, Tom would predict, I'll predict that Tom believes he is related to a banana. Professor Dave's related to a strawberry. The guy I did the other night's related to a ladybug. I predict Tom's related to a banana in his own mind, okay? The Bible says they will bring forth after their kind. Charlie wrote a book about the origin of species. Anyway, so let me get up here. So we got a bunch of stuff on dogs. So far, we've seen dogs, wolves, and coyotes are able to interbreed. So they're probably the same family and probably the same kind. I'm not sure if the biblical kind matches the family or the genus or species. Actually, I don't think the animals care how we classify them. They know. If you want to know which ones are the same kind, ask the males. Turn all the animals loose in the woods. The male coyotes will seek out the female coyotes. They won't look for the pine trees. They won't look for the porcupines. They look for the female coyote. If you can't figure it out, Ask the males of any species. They will tell you. The aardvarks will tell you. They're not interested in the giraffe. They want Mrs. Aardvark, okay? Happens every time. 19 subspecies of coyote. Whoa, they might have had a common ancestor. Coyote, right. It's 339 breeds of dog. Let's see. Uh, the wolf, coyote, jackal have 78 chromosomes. Oh, interesting. Many of them can interbreed. If they can no longer, I don't know which exactly the same kinds were in the original creation. But I know it's pretty obvious to a four-year-old if they're the same kind now. Let me get up to some other stuff here. Porcupines, sunflowers, have the same number of chromosomes. Does that prove a porcupine's related to a sunflower? No. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it just happens. There's 34 chromosomes. So what? I bet we could find books that are written in the library here that all use the same 26 letters of the alphabet. What does that prove? They, they wrote each other? No. The same, that's, the, that's the language with which you write English. Okay. Dogs, dogs, dogs. Let's see. I did all this right. Now, they can bring forth. Okay. Dog, wolf, coyote can bring forth. Dog and a, a coyote and a banana cannot. The dog and the banana cannot. And the wolf and the banana cannot. Now, they have rodeos in Texas where the cows jump. They ride cows and get them to jump over fences. 
I predict cows can jump. I accept the fact that cows can jump. I accept that. Therefore, if you take your cow to the gym, make him work out every day, take vitamins, someday the cow will be able to jump over the moon. Is that a good prediction? No. There's a limit how high cows can jump. Have they reached the limit yet? I don't know. Probably getting close. Maybe next year somebody will break the limit, break, break the record by a quarter inch, and he'll get a medal or something. Okay. But they're not going to jump over the moon. Tom, you don't understand. Deliberately, you don't understand. Variations happen, but they're limited. There are 250 breeds of cows now, and they might have had a common ancestor called a cow. That's as far as it goes. They'll never jump over the moon. Let's see, uh, 250 breeds of cows might have had a common ancestor. Six types of corn <clears throat> might have had a common ancestor. 200 varieties of wheat, whoa, they might have had a common ancestor called wheat. I accept the fact that variations happen within the kind. I predict wheat will always, always bring forth wheat. 4,000 varieties of potatoes, whoa. I accept the fact they had a common ancestor called a potato. I predict if you plant potatoes, you will grow potatoes. I make a prediction. It'll always happen anywhere on the planet you do it. That potato, you stick it in the ground, it'll never grow into a bobcat or a mountain lion or an elephant. Never. It'll always be a potato. Okay? There's lions, tigers, they can crossbreed. They normally don't. Buff, buffalo and beefalo and bison can crossbreed. Okay. The sheep and the goat can make a geep. Maybe they're the same kind. But that doesn't prove they're related to an elephant or a banana. See, in your guys' mind, you see these variations, <clears throat> jaguar and a lion, made a jag lion. Okay, you're still a cat. <clears throat> the Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. We've got 35 breeds of chickens right here in our farm. There's a total of 500 varieties of chickens. This textbook says jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. I'd be willing to predict if you crossbreed chickens, you'll always get a chicken of some kind. Always, without exception. Never will you get anything but a chicken. But you guys want me to believe a chicken and an earthworm are related. That's not science. They bring forth after their kind. <clears throat> 225 species of owls. Wow. They might have had a common ancestor. An owl. Eight species of bears. Might have had a common ancestor called a bear. But you guys don't get it. You think because we see these variations, therefore everything is related. You just, I don't know how to explain it to you. Let's see, they tried to raise the sugar content of the sugar beet during World War II to get more sugar for the troops. <clears throat> With selective breeding, they were able to raise the sugar beet from 6% to 17%, but they hit a brick wall. They couldn't go any further. Wow, what happened here? They reached a limit. The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. I predict moose, elk, caribou might have had a common ancestor. I don't know if they did or not. It'd be a good field of research, but they're the same kind of animal. If you see varieties in walnuts, got a friend of mine, a doctor in uh, nearby town who crossbreeds pecans and hickories. He gets hickon nuts. They sell them, hickons. I predict they'll always bring forth a tree that will produce a nut, always. I predict that, okay? Now, whether what kind of nut, it's not gonna bring forth a fruit, it's not gonna bring forth an apple or a banana, it's gonna be a nut of some kind. There are 50 varieties of watermelons now they've been able to raise. I predict if you plant the seeds from any one of them, anyone, you'll get a watermelon. I predict that. I'll bet you five bucks you get a watermelon every time, every time. But you, but you have on a chart, Tom, you guys have these family trees that show watermelons going back to an amoeba. And you believe that. The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. How many mangoes are there? Man, over a thousand? Might have had a common ancestor called a mango. God said they'd bring forth after their kind. 2,500 varieties of apples in the U.S., 7,500 in the world, might have had a common ancestor called an apple. Take the seed from any one of those 7,500 varieties and plant it. I predict you'll get an apple every time. 17,000 species of wasps, 3,000 varieties, no, 15,000 varieties of tomatoes. Wow, I bet they had a common ancestor. Tomato, they bring forth after their kind. 1,000 varieties of bananas. They bring forth after their kind. I predict you'll always get a banana off that tree every time, never exception. But you guys put these charts and say, oh, wow, plants, animals, and fungi have a common ancestor. This is pure propaganda. This is not science. I've been asking for years, where's the scientific evidence for real evolution? To say the four different types of elephants, African elephant, Asian elephant, mammoth, and mastodon had a common ancestor, I'd go along with that. But you want to connect them back to a tomato and an amoeba. 
That's not science. That's a religion. There's 1,100 varieties of bats in the world, itty bitty ones and great big ones. They might have had a common ancestor they bring forth after their kind. That's a prediction I will make that evolution cannot fulfill. You guys believe leopards and lions have a common ancestor with a ladybug, don't you, Tom? I believe the cat family might have come from a common ancestor, cats. Let's see, they crossbreed the <clears throat> lions and tigers and get a liger. They get a tigon, a lie tigon, a lie liger, a liard. These, can, these animals can be crossbred. They normally don't, but they can be. They have a common ancestor. How many kinds of oaks? Wow. Dozens of varieties of oaks might have had a common ancestor. Oak. I predict if you plant any acorn from any one of them, it'll grow a tree every time. Every time. White oak, water oak, red oak, that makes a tree. 195 varieties of chickens, eight varieties of bears, 60 species of oaks. They bring forth after their kind. I accept the fact that there are varieties of just about everything, and they might have had a common ancestor with that same kind, but that you do not, but therefore all plants and animals are related? No. This is dumb. Capital D dumb, okay? Stupid. And it's criminal to teach that stuff to kids. I'm sick of it. Okay? 45 varieties of pumpkins. 111 species of tr pine trees, 12,000 species of grass, 150 species of roses, man, 60 species of rats, plus the new one we got in the White House, okay? Let's see, 1,000 species of sharks, 60 species of eagles. I agree, there's variation that happens. I make a prediction, eagles will always produce eagles, without exception. But you guys want to take these little tr tree of the eagles and the tree of the whales and the tree of the bananas and the tree of the... Uh, watermelons, and draw a line to a common ancestor. This is not science. This is propaganda. The evolutionists assume, they agree that there's variations. We all agree on that. But you assume if you add enough time, billions of years, you can go back and all these had a common ancestor. This is not science. This is pure propaganda. This is evolution is evil. It's dumb. There is no geologic column. There is no time to go back to. And the fossils don't count at all. Tom, not a single fossil you pointed out, Archaeopteryx or any of the rest of them, not a single one counts as evidence for evolution. You don't know that that fossil had any children, and you sure don't know it's the ancestor of anything today. You can imagine that if you want. But I predict you will continue to believe this theory because you like it. It gives you freedom from God's rules. I predict most of you evolutionists are liking your evolution theory because of that very reason. It gives you freedom. There's no God telling you what to do. That's really why you want that. I predict judgment day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I predict your knee will bow and you will pro 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 profess that and it'll be too late. I'm here to help you. 855-BIG-DINO, call me. I'll be glad to lead you to the Lord. Add three more, four more baptized today. We'll get you into the God's kingdom. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, there we go. 12 minutes from the each of you. So we're now moving into the discussion portion. Lots of interesting points and topics to discuss. Again, gentlemen, Tom, Kent, thank you for your time for this important debate. Uh, since Kent just ended with his opening statement, um, I am going to hand it to you, Tom, in one second. But I do want to point out that um, Kent, a little bit of an echo from your side. So what I'm going to be doing is muting whoever's not talking and kind of go from there. Tom, you okay? I, I'm not sure. If no, you're I'm not. I'm not experiencing some mutations. So I'm I'm a little confused. Uh, Donnie, just to check that the title of the debate was "Novel Testable Predictions That Are Made by Like Creationist Evolution." Right? Is that, is that correct? That's right. Uh, and Kent, Kent, you agree the debate title is "Novel Testable Predictions"? Is that is that correct? Uh, I do hundreds of these, and I had gave tours today. I didn't even look at the title of the debate, but I didn't I didn't see you make any predictable. Uh, what are you saying the title is again exactly? Predictions? Novel, novel. testable predictions. Is it not a novel, predict, predictable prediction to say cows produce cows? I predict no. it'll happen in the next 500 what, years. What does novel mean? Well, new. There's no, no reason to get a new prediction. Yes, if I correct. predict this correct. will fall, we, so I have we, to keep predicting it. A new prediction about gravity. Well, let's, let's go one word at a time. So you're correct. Novel means new. What does status quo mean? Well, the way things are and the way things are accepted. What yes. did you present? What wait, did wait, you wait, present? Wait, wait, wait. Look, one, one, one thing at a time. So, um, status quo and novel; those two things are mutually exclusive, <clears throat> like they're antonyms. Correct? They're the opposite of one another. Not necessarily, but uh, go ahead with what your thought is. What? So, so status quo is the norm. Novel is 
the opposite of the norm. It's new, new. Like I'll, I'll just I'll just read the definitions. Uh, novel is new or unusual in an interesting way. Status quo is the existing state of affairs, especially regarding social or political ideas. So, so status quo, existing state of affairs, novel is new or unusual. Those are opposites, right? Those are literally the opposite. They're literally antonyms. Yeah, I, I reserve the right to challenge that later. But you, did you give a yeah. new prediction from evolution? You predicted well, I, something I did, new? but I just, just want to go back. So, so status quo is the, the current way things are. And so if you're making a prediction that the current way things are will continue to be the current way things are, that's not a novel prediction. That's a status quo prediction. So that's the opposite of a novel prediction. So, so a novel prediction is to predict something new or unusual that we don't know yet, something that's not the status <clears throat> quo, something that we expect in the future that is not the things we currently know. So like, for example, predicting that there's a double hinged jaw joint that we see, and we're going to discover in the future that these double hinged jaw joints were actually fused into a single hinged jaw joint, which is something we literally had no evidence for. It's a prediction, so we're expecting to find this later, but we have no past evidence. We've never seen this before. And then we discover it in a fossil. That would be a novel, testable prediction, which was confirmed. So it was a new thing that we had never seen before that we predicted, so a novel prediction, and we tested it by looking for it. So a novel, testable prediction, and it was confirmed. That, that's, that's a good example of a novel, testable prediction. Your example, that cows will produce cows, that's the status quo. We already know that. Something from the past. That's that's the status quo prediction. It's not a novel prediction. So so the title of the debate was what are the novel predictions that creationism can provide? So I'd like any examples of those if you have them. <clears throat> well, I, I, for the third time, Tom, I'm not going to necessarily accept your definitions of these words. I, I wasn't prepared for that at all, but I'll look at it. And I'll, I'll come back later with another with an answer to that. But you did not give a novel prediction about evolution because you're counting on fossils. You said if we find a single hinge jaw that turns into a, you know, you predict there's going to be a double hinge jaw. So you find a fossil with a double hinge jaw. That doesn't prove it's part of your prediction. If I predict that's, we dig down in the ground, we're going to hit water. Yeah, okay, we might do that. So no, I, d I disagree, but I'd like you to show me ex what's the best one you gave or your friend gave in the video that you would like to talk about what, what was predicted that has been found that is novel that you think supports the evolution theory? All of them were fossils. None of those count. You don't know they had any children. You don't know the fossils related to anybody alive today. What does novel mean? You're stuck, you're stuck on this, aren't you? Well, I'm, I'm very confused by the words you just said. I agree. You're very confused. Okay. Oh, yes. Novel. Very, yes. Novel very, means... Everyone is very confused. Now, now what? So you, you <clears> said that. The double hinge jaw joint is not a, a novel testable prediction. That's that's what you said. And now I'm well, very confused get... by this because novel means new. Uh -huh. Testable means we can test it. Prediction means something that we'll discover in the future. So a novel testable prediction is a new thing that we don't know that is going to be tested and found to be correct in the future. And so someone predicted based off of looking at a fossil that we will define that we would find a different kind of a fossil that we hadn't discovered yet. So we're going to find a new kind of fossil where the double hinged <laughs> jaw joints were fused together. Then okay. we looked, so we tested, so we, there's a new, new prediction, new prediction, and we looked and we found it. So it's, it, it fits the novel word. It fits, it fits the prediction word and it fits the testable word. So I'm not, I'm not following your logic here, how that's not a novel testable prediction when it fits the novel, it fits the testable if it's the prediction words, I don't which which words am I missing here? Um, I'm not going to accept the definition you gave until I do a moral study on that. But if you predict <clears throat> that a what? jaw that a, a jaw fused to be solid, okay, and you find a fossil with a fused jaw, you don't know that that's fulfilling your prediction. <clears throat> it might just be an animal that's gone extinct. Lots of animals have gone extinct. You don't know that that's in a progression from one to the other. You find a fossil and you put it between two other ones. That doesn't prove there's any connection. It's a tricycle. Of, 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 suppose all we had was two-wheel bicycles and four-wheel cars. That's all we had. And I predict if we look around in the junkyard, we might find a three-wheel. Wow. So in the junkyard, we find a tricycle. Wow. Therefore, it's related in your thinking. No, I don't, I don't agree with that at all, Tom. No fossils well, that's, that's, count. That's fine. Listen, listen Would that be, no that would be a great example? Count. No fossils count. All wait, wait, you know wait. is it died. How can you guys not understand that? You don't know that fossil had any children. 
But go so, ahead. So, so I, I want to go back to the title of the debate. So I'd like you to look up these words because it's kind of the entire point of the debate. Like um, novel, testable prediction. And I don't understand because predicting that we're going to find a tricycle in the junkyard, that's not novel, but it's a testable prediction. So that's, that's close. Uh, but I, I need to like... <clears throat> the whole point of the debate is what novel testable predictions does creationism provide? That's that's what I'm here for. That's what we're here to discuss. And so if you could help me out by understanding or looking up what those words mean so that you can give me an example of one of those things, I would really appreciate it because that's kind of the entire topic of the debate. That's the whole point. Okay. Uh, Donnie? Did the title include the word creation, or is he supposed to give novel, testable predictions for evolution? The whole purpose of this series is for you guys to provide evidence for evolution. If creation's true, and the animals have always brought forth after their kind, I don't need to give any, I can predict we'll find fossils in the ground because of the flood. I don't have to, there is no new, there's nothing new to find. God said they bring forth after their kind. He said that, what, 6,000 years ago. It's been happening ever since. You're supposed to provide novel prediction and evidence for evolution. I don't have to prove creation. I'm not demanding you all pay for my theory to be taught in the schools. You're demanding that we all pay for your theory to be taught in the schools and brainwash these poor kids. So, Donnie, read the title to the debate to me. So the exact title is um, Testable Predictions in Brackets Evidence for Evolution. So in other words, you know, Tom... <clears throat> put forth what he believes are future, you know, novel future testable predictions. And since making testable predictions is the gold standard of science, Tom is saying the fact that evolution makes these predictions makes it a more superior model than than the creation model. If if that makes sense, Tom, or you can because well, I, I specifically agreed to novel. You said you sent me that in the message, novel testable predictions, right? That was that was the criteria we're going off of. Okay, keep reading, Donnie. Novel, no, Donnie, read it one more time. Tom didn't get it. Novel, predictable project, uh, predictions about what? Novel, testable predictions, uh, either evidence of evolution or creation. No, 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 Donnie, read, read the title. <laughs> well, the exact title, I mean, the debate's been set on the channel for over a month now. It's testable predictions in brackets, evidence for evolution. Okay. So, Burden of proof's on you, Tom, not on me. Nope, I agree to novel testable predictions from creationism. Creationism or evolution, that's, that's fine. Which debate. one's better? But I'm only debating that is, does creationism provide novel testable predictions? That's the debate I agree to. Um, and anything that else works. I don't care about. Tom, that title's been posted for a month. You did not give any novel predictions for evolution, and the burden of proof's on you. Where so is the need... evidence for evolution? You so find if, a burden... Donnie, Donnie, if you just mistyped the title and gave me the wrong one, you sent me specifically novel test oh. predictions. That's what I came here to debate. Okay, wait. Let's schedule, let's schedule a debate later on that topic. But I, this whole series has been, where's the evidence for evolution? Where's the evidence that you think you are related to a tomato? Don't you, Tom? So we need to go back to the debate. I'm only here to talk about does creationism provide novel test predictions. I've, no. I provided them. So I'm happy to defend no. the evolution no. side, but he's got to actually kidding. understand the debate topic. Like I'm here, I need to see, I need to hear from his side. What okay. novel predictions does creationism provide? I, that's, that wasn't the title I understood. I don't, I don't have anything. There, there's nothing new to provide. You provide. said you didn't even read the title. So don't talk, Hence. Donnie, okay. I need, he, I need to Donnie, actually focus Donnie on the topic. Donnie just read it to. to us. Donnie just read it to us. The burden of proof's on you. Where's when the he was talking to me, he said novel testable predictions. That's what I came here to debate. I don't care what I didn't right. look okay, at his okay, YouTube here. channel. Okay, I'll, I'll talk now since you guys have been talking a while. So it's the evolution debate challenge series. So obviously right. the affirmative is going to be the evolutionist. Now the line of evidence that, that you're providing or defending, uh, Tom Jump, in terms of uh, evidence for evolution is testable predictions. So you're saying, you know, the evidence for biological evolution is that it makes testable predictions. That's what the debate is. That doesn't ne necessitate, you know, that we have to go the route of, you know, uh, testable predictions from the creationist side. But if you're saying that, you know, the lines of evidence you're providing means that biological evolution is true because they make accurate testable predictions, then, you know, where we go from here you know, if, if Kent can show that, you know what, no, these aren't testable predictions and creation, the alternative model makes better testable predictions. We can go that route. doesn't look like Kent wants to go that route. So it's, it's up to you guys. The, the debate title is testable predictions in brackets, evidence for evolution. So, so again, I, mean, I didn't, that's not the topic I agreed to debate. So you need to bring up the topic I agreed to debate. 
I need to hear the novel testable predictions provided by creationism. I don't care. I've already debated him on de de debunked Kent on every other topic. This is the one I came to debate because it's unique. This is the one I want to hear about from creationists because they can't answer it. That's okay. why Kent is hiding and running because he knows he can't answer it. So I want an answer to this question. Are there any novel testable predictions <clears throat> creationism provides? If he just says no, that's great. But until he says no, then this is what I want to hear about. This is what I came to talk about. I didn't talk about. I don't care about anything else. Well, there are lots of testable predictions from the creation model. The creation model says 6,000 years ago, God made everything in six days. Based on that, I predict there'll be limits to the age of the earth on all sorts of things like the moon receding from the earth and the earth flowing in its spin and the oceans getting saltier. And I cover that on video number one in great detail. I predict there will be scientific evidence this earth cannot be billions of years old. I can make that prediction if that's what you want. The Bible says there was a flood that destroyed everything. I predict we'll find fossils all over the world. I bet they'll find whale fossils in the Sahara Desert. They do. Sure enough. I predict they'll find fossils at, in, in Greenland of, of desert animals. So I could predict all kinds of things based on the flood, but you guys are constantly trying to shift the burden of proof over to the creationists so we take attention off of your stupid religion of evolution. Where's the evidence that any animal has ever produced a different kind of offspring? There isn't any, Tom. Nobody's ever seen any animal. We see dogs produce dogs, cows produce cows. That's all anybody's ever seen. You predict we'll find evidence that cows and bananas are related. Where's the evidence that cows and bananas are related? <clears throat> there isn't any. And I know you well, don't I, want the burden of proof on you, but you guys want this to cool. So evidence is novel testable predictions. If you can make novel test predictions, you have evidence. So again, you need to understand the title of the debate to know what evidence is. Do, oh, do you understand what novel test that. prediction means? Okay, for the fifth time, that is not, it's everything that this whole series Donnie has done has been evidence for evolution. And it's in the title, it's been posted for a month. Okay, where's the, where's the novel testable prediction? I literally just answered that, Kent. Listen carefully. Novel I testable listen. predictions are evidence. I presented novel testable predictions, but if you don't understand what novel testable predictions mean, then you don't understand why it's evidence. So you need to understand what those words mean to understand why everything I presented is evidence because they are novel, testable predictions. Okay. Is so it? Do you understand so what thinking, novel, testable predictions mean? Right. So if they oh, find yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to jump in. I'm going to jump in, guys, because, you know, I've got somebody here saying, oh, Tom didn't make a mistake. Donnie did. Listen, I just pulled up our correspondence. You can either confirm or deny. And I said, I am thinking of, of a July debate. Okay, that way it's not too close to the others. And then I said, here's the topic, evidence for evolution dash testable predictions. Is, 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 isn't that what you agreed to? I just looked up our correspondence. I mean. <laughs> well, no, because so, then I misunderstood it if that's what you okay, thought. Okay, well, you misunderstood I it, but I just, looked up the, wait, I just looked up the correspondence and it says evidence for evolution so, testable so predictions. You should, you've seen me debate enough to know by testable predictions, I mean novel testable predictions. No one gives a damn about testable predictions. That's nothing. What we want, novel testable predictions is the only meaningful criterion in science. Like right. you can test any prediction. I predict I'm going to pick my nose tomorrow. No one gives a shit. The only thing that counts as evidence in science is novel testable predictions. So if you don't understand that, that was your mistake in putting that sentence there because testable predictions in science means novel. No one cares if I can prick my nose tomorrow. It's got to be. I agree with that. I agree. I, I've right. written an well, entire so if you book. You don't on understand that. testable predictions, then you made a mistake here. Testable predictions in science means novel every time, no exception. Right. I, I, I agree with. I've written an entire book on novel testable predictions. When I say testable predictions, I think it just goes without question. <laughs> a testable prediction has to be novel. Has to be. I agree. Novel. I agree completely. That's the topic of the debate: novel testable predictions. Right. Right. So Kent needs to address the topic: novel testable predictions. Oh, what? Well, not have to be oh, with those okay, other two okay. words, Tom. It's okay to use the two words by itself. I predict No, it's not. Donnie no, it's just not. admitted this. Donnie just Every literally said has to be novel. Yes, yes, Donnie literally just said this. He literally just said testable predictions we understand they must be novel. <laughs> Verbatim just said that 5 seconds ago. Tom, that is insane. I can make a prediction that the sun will come up tomorrow because it has every day for the last who knows how long. That's a testable prediction. It doesn't have to be novel. Why do you have to stick the word novel in there? What's wrong with you? For it to be evidence. That's the point of no. evidence. It has to be. It would be evidence. Okay, I'll make a prediction. If you plant potatoes, they'll grow potatoes. That's a prediction. I predict it's if I stick an acorn in the ground, no tree will grow. Not evidence, not novel. Well, 
what you gave is not evidence for evolution. You gave evidence. Somebody predicted did, we're going to find a fossil. A novel okay. testing prediction. Did I give a novel testing okay. prediction? Yes or no? Donnie, Donnie, this is going nowhere. We're not going to get anywhere in this debate. Uh, you want to reschedule? and re 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 the, the whole series has been, where's the evidence for evolution? Tom's trying to sneak it in and put the burden of proof on me. I don't have to prove creation. No, I asked, <laughs> did I give novel testable predictions? Did I, meaning me, did my words entail, or the video, I did that entail a novel testable prediction? Did, Your were friend, those presented in the video? No, Tom, you did not. Your friend uh, made a video for you, and you flapped your jaws for a while, but you did not give anything that's evidence for evolution. Did I give you a novel testable prediction? You did not. That, which one of those is evidence that a banana is related to a Stop cow? talking about evidence. Did I give a novel testable prediction? Did I give a novel testable prediction? I, yes no, or no? No, sir. You did not. Okay, Donnie, How? let's reschedule. Donnie, this is going nowhere. He's, he's stuck on this one, okay? He's not going to go off it. Where's the best evidence for evolution has been the whole series. I've done, what, 15 or 20 debates with you now on this topic. I would like Tom to give us evidence. He thinks making a novel prediction that they're going to dig in the ground and find an Archaeopteryx, and then they find one, and therefore they think, by the way, that's not a good, good example for evolution, but they find a bird in the ground that has unusual features, okay? Maybe that's a line that went extinct. Now, you don't know that's involved in any branch of, of science. That's not evidence for evolution. And the whole purpose of this series and the whole purpose of this debate tonight is where's the evidence for evolution? Johnny, there isn't is, any. No, is novel testable predictions evidence? Somebody keep track so, how many times he says that, okay? He's not getting it. Johnny, is novel testable predictions evidence? Okay, so my understanding- Please, please uh, answer, don't, don't be biased here. What is the correct answer to that question? I would say if a model does make a future novel testable prediction, then it, it can either be, if it's a, a prediction that comes true, right? then it, it could be used, I think, utilized as a line of evidence for evolution. And it would, it would be up to Kent to address it. For example, Tom, you're saying that evolution makes novel testable predictions. Yes. So the question is, we need to look at each so-called prediction and we need to see if, if, if that lines up with, with evolutionary theory. So, but I mean, if, if we're not- if Well, we're the not first thing he has to admit that they are novel testable predictions. That, that we're stuck on this part. Did I make a novel testable prediction? Is novel testable predictions evidence? Those are the two questions Kent can't answer for some reason. Well, we could take we could take one, Tom, that you think is like the best example of a future novel prediction, and we I can, did. And we can have Kent address so it. Is that a novel testable prediction? That's the first question. Is the double, double hinted jaw joint that was predicted before we ever found them fused? So we predicted they'd be fused, then we found them later, and it was fused. Is that a novel testable prediction? Donnie, <laughs> not, I mean, Donnie, if I was debating, I'd, I'd probably just be pointing out the fact that creation has predicted, you know, gene, genome wide functionality, evolution has predicted. I know Tom's going to disagree with this, but I mean, there are a lot of future novel predictions that creationists have made for sure. Cold Correct. slabs, magnetic field decay, you know, there, there's been Donnie, quite a few. So it's, it's kind of like which model makes the best testable predictions. But, yes, you know, great. if if there's not been any any prep for it, then we can certainly wrap it up here. Go ahead, Kent. Well, plus, I, I told you many times, as you called me to discuss debate, I'll be glad to debate any and all evolutionists in the world, one topic at a time. He just threw out 10 different things he wants me to refute with the so-called evidence for evolution. No, no, which one, which one is evidence for evolution? They predicted I they would find Archaeopteryx and they found Archaeopteryx. Now, I would point out in a court of law, is, is suppose I wanted to plant uh, a, some evidence to get somebody else. I predict if we look under that guy's mattress, we'll find a knife. But I planted the, mat the knife under the mattress. Oh, is that a novel, testable prediction? Because I'm trying to frame the guy. Did somebody make up these, did somebody make up these uh, predictions knowing what the evidence was going to be? Because they planted it. I mean, as, as evidence in a court of law, this whole this whole thing would go nowhere. And same with any fossil. You find a fossil. I predict this clam is the ancestor of all the whales. What? Clams always make baby clams, without exception. So there is no evidence from fossils for evolution at all. None of them would count. There is no fossil record, Tom. There's a bunch okay, of Okay, that's fossils. great. Could you answer my questions now? I don't think you know what the question is, okay? Where's I, the the question is, is, did I make a novel testable prediction? That's question one. Se second question is, are novel testable predictions evidence? Those are the two questions. That, that's all I want. Answer, that's okay. what I want. 
Donnie, read, read what you wrote to him a month ago about this debate. Read that title one more time. Do Donnie admitted testable predictions means Donnie, novel. Donnie, shut well, his mic off. Shut his mic off and read that prediction again. Read the, read the title again. Because I agree to debate on where's the evidence for evolution. Right. I don't think he gave so, any. So the title is Evidence for Evolution dash testable predictions. Last week it was evidence for evolution, hominid fossil record. You know, next week it's evidence for evolution mutations. So Tom, you chose testable predictions as yes, your line. You, of you admitted for that that means right. novel. You admitted that. You literally said it. And I agree, it does mean novel. We know in science the only testable predictions that matter are novel. So that's the topic. I agree. Now, the question I asked. Is novel testable predictions evidence? Donnie said yes. I say yes. All science says yes. So does Kent think novel testable predictions are evidence? That's a question. That's what I'm asking. That's the second question I asked. And the first question is, did I make a novel testable prediction? Did I present a novel testable prediction in the video? The double well, I, I should, is that I, I, a novel testable I'll, prediction? I'll clarify. My specific position is that, and I'm not debating, I'm just saying the creationist model makes better testable predictions. Tom, yes. you and I have had a debate, a debate on that. I understand that, right? your position. I understand right. that. But okay. the point is I'm asking Kent, just the very, this is like step one of the argument. Is novel testable predictions evidence? Question mark. Second, is the things I said, double-handed jaw joint, is that an example of one of the novel testable predictions? These are not like hard questions. These are super basic step one questions. Donnie. Would you look through your correspondence to him? Did you ever use the word novel? Is this is he trying to add this in here? There's nothing novel um, about the idea that dogs produce dogs. Everybody's seen that for thousands of years. But he believes dogs right. and bananas are related. What? It it just says te testable prediction. So the, the, that could that could partly be my fault for not okay. putting so, novel. Do, in Donnie, there. in science, the, the, does anyone care about time. testable predictions or do they care about novel testable predictions? In science, right. does anybody care about testable predictions on its own ever? A, a testable prediction would be like me looking at some random guy in the street and saying, you know what? I, I predict he could hit a baseball 250, you know, feet away. And then we would have him, you know, swing the bat a couple times. And if he does that, you know, that's, that's a future testable prediction. That, that's something I could make a prediction and then we can find out if future observations prove that to either be true or false. A future um, testable prediction is I will pick my nose in one second. Boom. That's a, th is that evidence of anything? Does anybody care about those? Does anybody care you can make a future prediction? No. In science, what do they care about? Do, do, is it novel testable predictions, Donnie? Is that what everyone cares about in science? Okay, well, I, I, I'm just moderator. I, I, if you want, guys, we could just shut it you down. You literally here, took his position and questions. presented lots of examples of testable predictions or novel testable predictions you think creationism does, and now you're going to say, oh, I'm the moderator. I can't literally answer what everyone in science accepts is just basically patently true. Come on, Donnie. Don't be biased. Well, I, oh, I don't know if you want me to get in on the debate or if you want me now to. Now you're going to accuse him of bias. Do you guys, scientists okay. look for novel testable predictions, Donnie? Is that what they're looking for? Are they looking for just testable predictions or do they want novel testable predictions? What is everyone in science looking for, Donnie? Well, a scientist Donnie. is looking for, yeah, a, a novel prediction. Okay. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Yes, Kat. they are. So if you ask okay. a scientist to debate testable predictions, what are they going to debate? Are they going to debate any kind of testable prediction or specifically novel testable predictions? Well, I, you know, I, I guess the problem is, is, is the title. We didn't put novel in there. So, you know, we, we could chalk that he up. Wants, to, he wants to add it. Now, listen, now I listen to him. Listen to me. I think we should reschedule or you debate him, Donnie, on what he wants on novel testable predictions. I could predict if you find coal, you will also find probably fossil leaves and with the coal and evidence of uh, pet, maybe petrified tree stumps in the coal. That'd be a novel testable prediction, because sure enough, when they find coal all over the world, that's what they find. But this is going nowhere. He's, he's stuck on this one little point. Where's the evidence for evolution? My next debate with Tom Jump, I want that to be the title. What's the best e single one? What's the one best evidence for evolution? He thinks the best evidence, if I'm understanding him now, is the fact that they were able to make novel, testable predictions. Yes. Is that your evidence? Correct. That the yes. theory is true? Yes. Therefore, beca because they make predictions, therefore, uh, owls are related to bears. Is that, does that provide evidence that owl, you believe owls are related to bears? Yeah, if the hypothesis that owls are related to bears can okay. predict the future and get it correct, yes, that's evidence owls are related to bears. So these family trees that they show with humans and birds and reptiles and ladybugs and pine trees and worms having a common ancestor, 
you think what you presented is evidence that the kids should all be taught this tree right here. Yes. Okay. I disagree completely. All we've ever seen, and it's like, you got to understand this and you won't, but I'm going to tell it again. Fossils don't count at all. You can't go back in time. There is no fossil record. There's a bunch of fossils because of a flood. Noah's flood formed all the fossils. Fossils aren't forming today anywhere. How many animals died today? Millions. How many are going to fossilize? None. I think nearly all the fossils in the world are from Noah's flood. And you want to somehow stick them in a family tree like this. This is dumb. This is where the problem is. And if you want to evidence. believe ladybugs are related to Tom Jump, you can believe that. But our that's prophecies, not science. Our prophecies in the Bible evidence, if they are correct, that the Bible is true. That's one of many evidences that the Bible why? is true. But why we're not here it... to debate we're not here to debate the Bible. Why, Where's why, the evidence for evolution? Why is prophecy evidence? What makes it evidence? Is it the fact that they made a projection into the future of something they didn't know and it came true? Is that that's what makes it evidence, right? They knew the future right. before they I predict every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I predict Tom Jump's going to get on his knees and say, Jesus, you're Lord. I predict that'll happen one day, Tom. That is phenomenal. That is, and why that is phenomenal is that that is a prediction about the future. It's testable and it's novel. It's a new thing we don't expect, right? No, you don't accept it, but it'll happen. No, 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 no. no. The reason that's a good, why it would be good evidence, the reason that that prediction would be very, very good evidence is because it's a prediction about the future. It's testable and it's new. It's something very different from anything we've seen before in the past, right? That's what makes it very good evidence. Right. Donnie, we need to get a clear title of what the debate is that we both agree to. I understand what he, I, I see clearly what he's trying to do, okay? The purpose of this whole series is not for me to prove creation. He thinks, he thinks because they made a novel prediction of finding chromosome two fused, therefore, People are related to ladybugs. That's a giant leap of faith. You, you just admitted testable, novel testable predictions are evidence. You just literally said it. Well, the Bible makes lots of predictions. Some have come true already, and the rest will come true. But yes, we're not and those are evidence, right? Tom, well, and, you don't get it. We're not here to discuss the Bible. I'm, I'm, the not, I'm not discussing is, the Bible. I'm, I'm just asking you, are those evidence? Right, when guys, the Bible <laughs> predicts something, you guys want to wrap right. it up now? How about, okay, how about, we just hit the hour mark, and we managed Donnie, to somehow do this for an hour. You guys yeah, want to uh, call it here? Already, yeah, it's already been an hour. Let's do audience questions and see what they think, and let's get uh, get this moving off of what he's stuck on here. Go ahead. Okay. All right, let's do some audience questions and see where we can go from here. Um, okay, well, here's a good question, Tom. Few people in the chat want clarification, so we'll, we'll consider this the first question. Jeremy Nolan asks, "What is what is the difference between a novel echo. prediction and a future prediction?" Echo, still hearing the echo. Yeah, you're good. All right. Uh, so a prediction is just anything to happen in the future. So if I predict I'm going to pick my nose in a second, so it's a prediction. Uh, wait a second, pick my nose. That's a prediction, and it came true. Is that evidence that, for example, anything about the universe, like the spaghetti monster is real or God is real? No, because it's not something we wouldn't already expect. A novel prediction is predicting something that we don't know yet, predicting something that we've never seen before. And if you can predict something we've never seen before and get it right, that's very, very good evidence. It means that your model, whatever it is, is able to tell us about the future of the universe before knowing about it. Just predicting something like the sun will rise tomorrow, no one cares because everybody already knows that or at least believes it with a high level of probability. So predicting something we already know, like cows will come from cows, isn't evidence of anything. Everybody can already predict that. What is evidence of one theory over the others is when you predict something that we've never seen before. So like if you predicted a cow would jump over the moon, one of the examples Kent, Kent uh, used, if that happened, that would be really good evidence for whatever your hypothesis was that allowed you to know that a cow was going to jump over the moon when nobody else could know that. So if you're, you have this special access to knowledge about reality, about the future of the reality that we don't know, it, no one else knows, then you have some, we have some reason to think that you have access to knowledge we don't have. If all you're doing is predicting something everybody already knows, cows will come from cows, the sun will rise tomorrow, no one takes that seriously because no one cares. Everyone already has that information. Novel testable predictions is a new thing nobody knows yet. Testable predictions are just literally anything about the future at all. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Kent, anything you want to add to that, brother? 
No, no, he said the same thing about 30 times now. Let's move on to something else. Go ahead. Okay, here we go. Let me see. Um, I guess I got some questions here from, okay. Uh, well, it, it's going to be up to you, Tom, a lot of these questions. I'm not sure if you're going to say they're off topic, but I'll put them up. And if you want to answer them, you can. If not, then we'll move on. So discipleship, uh, $10 super chat. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. He asked question for Tom Jump. Is the geologic column real proof for evolution? If you say yes, then you have to explain how there are trees standing up and connecting the layers. Uh, well, I can't explain that, but it's pretty easy. Just there are shifts in the strata. So like earthquakes or whatever causes things to fall and trees get stuck there. But who cares? Like, is it evidence for evolution? Only The only thing that counts as evidence is novel testable predictions. So if someone predicted that this would happen, then yeah, that would be evidence for evolution. So if someone predicted the strata, which they did, and we discovered that the strata was uh, separated in the way that was predicted, then yes, that would be evidence for evolution. So any novel predictions, any prediction about the future that we don't know yet that is discovered to be correct is evidence, whatever that may be. Okay. Uh, thank you, discipleship. Thanks, Tom. Kent, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think he just said, you know, any evidence we find is evidence for evolution. That's what he believes. But yes, all over the world, petrified trees are found standing up. There's a whole bunch of them up in central Alabama in the coal mine up there. Petrified trees in the vertical position, I think, clearly indicate the layers are not different ages. There is no such thing as a geologic column. It doesn't exist anywhere. They say the top layer is younger. Where is it coming from? Outer space? All the layers were shuffled up in the flood. We flip these things over once in a while and get a whole bunch of different layers of sand colors. Okay? Are the layers different ages? No. These guys are stuck on the stupid idea that the geologic column is true. It was made up in 1830. It doesn't exist anywhere. And the petrified trees in the vertical position connecting all their layers, I think is real clear evidence to anybody unbiased that the layers form in quickly. Within, within a year, the tree wouldn't rot. But the Bible says the, the, the flood, I predict if you find, if you dig almost anywhere in the world, you're going to find layers because of the Noah's flood. The Bible says there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem. I predict they'll build a temple in Jerusalem. We can go through Bible predictions if you want, but the whole purpose of this debate series is, where's the evidence for evolution? He counts on the fossils counting, and the fossils don't count for anything. Petrified trees standing up, running through all the layers, I think is clear evidence to anybody unbiased. The layers had to form very quickly around a standing tree. It happens all the time. They find hundreds, maybe even thousands of these have been found now. There's a whole bunch of them in Tennessee. So I think that's evidence the trees were buried rapidly. If he wants to make up a story, about how it petrified and then everything washed away and a new layer formed and then it washed away and a new layer formed washed away. This is dumb, but they, that's what they do though. Evolutionists count on that idea to answer this simple question. How can the layers be different ages when one tree is connecting them? They're not different ages. They're all the same age. Every layer on the planet is the same age. So, so just to clarify, I did not say anything was evidence. I said anything that is a novel testable prediction is evidence and it's not for evolution, it's for any hypothesis. So like like Ken said, if every knee will bow and the things in Revelation happen, that would be evidence of Christianity because it's a novel, testable prediction. I'm not saying like just evolution. This applies to literally everything. Novel, testable predictions are evidence for whatever hypothesis you have. Okay, well, we'll give you the last word there, Tom, since it was your question. George Bond asks, question for Tom Jump. How many wrong predictions have been made by the theory of evolution? I have no idea. Like, what difference does that make? Like, the fact that some people make wrong predictions it doesn't matter. Like, literally, all the predictions in Christianity are wrong, but the number of wrong ones is less important than can you get them right. Okay. Kent, anything you'd like to add? Well, the family trees they teach to our kids show that the humans and the birds and the reptiles and the ladybugs and the worms have a common ancestor. I think that's criminal to teach that to children. That's not true. It's nobody's ever seen this. This isn't science. But I predict they'll keep teaching it anyway because they like that religion. Go ahead. Tom, you can have the last word. Uh, well, it doesn't answer the question, but okay. All right, let's see. Um, Echo. <laughs> I'm looking at, okay, uh, we'll go to the beginning then. Question came in from Lando White. Where did uh, the genetic information or the bio code come from for the DNA to generate any function? 
Uh, information is a product of physical matter. This is Google Shannon Claude Information Theory 1958 paper. Information is a product of stochastic systems. Okay, Kent, anything you'd like to add? I think the genetic code to anything, any single creature, a lily, a, an, an amoeba, the E. coli bacteria, any single, any, any genetic code found in any living thing is more complex than the space shuttle more complex than all the NASA headquarters put together with all the computers they've got. I think it's impossible to be logical and believe that happened by chance. I think the genetic code came from God who wrote the code. And there might be some similarities in the code of different animals so that the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and I'd eat it, drink it and get the blonde hair. I think there has to be some similarities in the code so that we can, otherwise we can only eat each other. So my predict that we'll find similarities in the code. The deeper they look, the more they're going to find how complex the code is and how some similarities, <clears throat> like Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, both go to the same spell check. Wow, that's because the same guys are writing the code. I think God wrote the code to every living creature. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Kent. Uh, Tom, did you want a quick final word on that one, or should I move uh, on? Nope, that's fine. All right, uh, Wade Robbins, question for Kent. So he asks, after the flood, speciation must have been extremely rampant, but then suddenly came to a screeching halt. How do you explain this? Well, first, I think the question's invalid. It hasn't come to a screeching halt. New, new varieties are created all the time. There was no such thing as a chihuahua 300 years ago. People were too smart to have a dog like that, okay? So... <clears throat> I think that after the flood, animals diversified, and they would quickly, a family told me that's been in the dog kennel business for 100 years, three generations, they said, Mr. Oven, you give us 50 generic mutts, you pick out any dogs you want, we will selectively breed them, and in 100 years, we'll create every breed on the planet today, in 100 years. I think nature selects, and, and also humans, artificial selection, but it's still the same kind. If you turned all the dogs in the world loose in Alaska, only those with thick fur would survive like the husky or something. The uh, dingoes wouldn't survive up there. But if you turn the same dogs loose in the desert, now the dingoes survive and the huskies don't. So nature certainly selects, but it doesn't create anything. It didn't give the dog an air conditioner to live in the desert. It selected those with thin fur and long legs to get away from the heat of the desert. So natural selection works great. It doesn't create anything. So after the flood, I think the animals diversified. <clears throat> the climate was crazy for a while and, and still is. And certain animals would find more comfort in certain areas and be able to survive better in certain areas because nature would select them to survive. It didn't create anything. So I agree, speciation would happen, but it's been 4,400 years, plenty of time. But yet, I bet Wade believes that the ladybugs and the dinosaurs have a common ancestor. I don't think any amount of time is going to solve that problem. So you talk about rapid speciation. I'll give you trillions of years. Turn your amoeba to a whale and a ladybug and a dinosaur. I want to see that. And let's see it happen in the laboratory this time. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Kent. Uh, Tom, anything you want to add? Uh, no. All right. Um, no obligations for the debaters to add anything. This is typically how we run the Q&A. Everybody gets the chance to respond. So let's see. Um, next question here comes in from... Okay, so... This person asks, question for Tom, why are all of evolution's predictions of stuff we already found? Give us a prediction not yet discovered. Uh, well, literally, the entire video was just those. They literally said, here was a prediction made in a date, and then here is it discovered in a later date. That's all of the ones in the video provided by Jackson Reed are literally that. It's kind of the point. That's what the pre in front of prediction means. Okay, next one comes in from Patty Smith. Appreciate the support. So she says, James, guessing she means Tom Jump. Forget about morphological, or maybe she's having a debate in the chat. I don't know, but there is a question here. So forget about morphological changes. Explain even in a lab, bacteria creating millions of generations and trillions of offspring. We do not even see a novel protein fold, let alone never existing protein. Go ahead, Tom. I think we actually have seen novel protein folds. It just leads to his death normally, but so what? All right. Kent, anything you wanted to add? 
Well, yes, I think she's right. Uh, we don't, if you pick something with a short generation time, like bacteria, uh, there are some bacteria that have an eight hour generation time. They get born, grow up, get married, and have babies in eight hours. You can get, you know, several generations a day with those kind. And so I think they've watched them for the equivalent of millions of hu human years, and they don't see anything except bacteria produce bacteria. That's what I've been saying all along, that it's, it doesn't happen. They believe it happens if you, if you let it go long enough. This isn't science. Bacteria are not simple. They're extremely complex. 20,000 different kinds of bacteria. Nobody's ever seen a paramecium produce a non-paramecium, let alone a paramecium turn to a whale, even over billions of generations. It just doesn't happen. It's imagination. That's why evolution is a religion they believe in. Here it is, the amoeba, 670 trillion genome base pairs. 670 trillion in an amoeba. You really think that happened by chance? You need your head examined if you believe that. All right, thank you, Kent. Next question now for Tom. Stephanie Pribble, she asked, question for Tom. If there was an equal amount of evidence for both evolution and creation, which one would you choose to believe and why? Um, if there's an equal amount of evidence for two different hypotheses, they're equal it's rationally to choose. So it's rational to choose either one. Uh, I don't. I would probably just be agnostic if there was equal evidence of two different hypotheses. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Kent, anything you'd like to add? Well, I think Pascal's wager might fit in there if there was evidence for evolution. I still say there's none, and that's the whole debate series. Nobody's given any evidence for evolution. But if there was equal evidence for both, I would still choose the idea that there's a creator because that should be the safe side. If so, see, I have nothing to lose. If I'm wrong, I die, I rot in the ground. I've, I've had a wonderful life. If I'm right and Tom dies and I'm right, he's in trouble. So Pascal's wager fits in perfect here. So I would choose creation. Okay, thank you, Kent. And um, let me see here. Here's a question that comes in from SWE, $10 Super Chat. Thank you so much. Question for you, Kent. So she's asking, um, does Kent accept this as a novel prediction? When a sacrum of Artipithecus is discovered, it will turn out to be narrower and more ape-like than Astrolopiths because things don't re-evolve. Any thoughts on that, Kent? Well, no, because you're assuming this fossil had children and is related. Lining up fossils you find in the ground in some kind of order that you want things to happen, like an ape turning to a human, that's not science. That's like me lining up the bicycle, the tricycle, and the four-wheeler saying there, there's a similarity, there's a relationship here. There's no relation. Each one's designed to be what it is. So I don't think any fossil counts. I'll stick with that. And if they find the sacrum to uh, this, this creature, uh, they, they might be finding a, a creature that's gone extinct. How many animals have gone extinct? A whole bunch. That's the opposite of evolution. So, no, I don't think uh, that might be a prediction. They can make that if they want, and they'll probably jump all over that and say, yay, it worked, but they don't get it. No fossils count. None. There's no fossil record. There's a bunch of fossils, but they don't count as evidence for evolution. You don't know any of those bones had any children at all. Okay, now we got one for you, Tom. Jeremy Nolan is asking, uh, T. Jump, what novel predictions does evolution make, not past? If I were to interpret that, I think he's saying like, now in 2022, any novel predictions moving forward for evolution? Go ahead. Uh, well, the ones in the video listed modern testable predictions that were made by whatever the video was. I don't haven't been keeping up with the ones, but there definitely are some. Evolution makes uh, lots of them. So if you find the papers, you can find them. But I wasn't trying to find them specifically of this year. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Boomer 21. Um, actually, I think this is the last one. So here we go. Boomer 21, uh, $10 super chat. Thank you so much for... JT, jump Tom, is evolution, if evolution is true, I'm guessing, then how do you explain the skeletons of human giants that lie all over the world? <laughs> well, they don't exist. If they did, that would, I mean, I guess, be, yeah, that would be evidence of the Nephilim or something. Like that would be, that's a novel testable prediction. You say there are giant human remains that are discovered and we did actually discover them. Yeah, that would be evidence of creationism. They just don't exist. 
Kent, anything okay. you want to add? Oh, absolutely. He needs to do more research on that. Uh, if you talk to Dr. Carl Ball in Glen Rose, Texas, he's got castings and made photographs of new freshly discovered giant human footprints. The person had to be 10, 12, 14 feet tall. Talk to Joe Taylor at Crosby Ten at uh, Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. He's found he's found them himself. I think there's lots of evidence that there were giant humans over 10 feet tall on this planet. Tom would never accept that because he wants to think his great, 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 great grandpa was a little chimpanzee and we're getting bigger, better, stronger, smarter. Because Satan told Eve, in the, if you follow me, ye shall be as gods, which is the evolution theory in a nutshell. So no, I think you're completely wrong. I think there have been giant human fossils found and everyone has to be discredited or sabotaged because it goes against the evolution religion. So yes, I think they have been found. Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. I believe there were giants in the earth in those days. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Tom. Question was for you. You can have the last word if you want. Uh, yeah, yeah. Either either they're conspiracy theories that were deliberately trying to prove their frauds, or they're actually frauds. W one of those two. The, okay. Or they're real. Uh, there's a third choice, Tom. They're real. You did left that one out. That, that was the first false choice. That, that was well. The first choice was it's a it's a conspiracy theory to try to show that they're false when they're actually true, or okay. they're all actually false. That, that was the those were, those were the two. Okay, so Tom, if I took you to a dig site where they're finding these things, and we dig in fresh virgin soil and find a bone from a human that is double normal size, obviously a human, would you accept it? If we found a fossil femur, a thigh bone, say four feet long indicating the person was 12 feet tall, would you then change and become a creationist? Well, that would definitely be evidence. So if we found a femur that was double the size of any human ever in recorded history, that would definitely be evidence. Sure, if you made a lot of different evidences that you could convince me over time, but I would then take that fossil and give it to experts and confirm it. And if they showed it was, yes, it was definitely human, then sure, that would definitely be evidence of creationism. Yay, we're getting somewhere. Go ahead. All right, here's the last one. I must have missed this one. This one is a super chat, so I'll get it in here. And it looks like it's uh, somebody in the chat, Shadow Rami. Thank you for the question. And they are asking you, Kent, if you um, can explain or what are your thoughts on the law of monophily? Well, if I understand that word to mean that, uh, you know, creatures always have children like themselves. They stay in the same phylum, monophily. I think dogs will always produce dogs. Cows will always produce cows. I think that's what we've seen for all of recorded human history. Has any farmer ever in the history of the world said, wow, my cow had a baby and it was a giraffe or anything other than a cow? Has any, no, I think that it, it's a law. It's a law. They always produce after their kind. Now see, that's going forward. But these guys like Tom want to imagine if we could go back, which we can't, it was different back then. Back then the amoeba could produce a whale over billions of generations. Now, now the amoeba can't do it, but they could back then. That's dumb. Thank you, Kent. Tom, uh, this is the last question. If you want to add anything to it, feel free to do so. Yeah, I got uh, three on my end. One of them is the same question about monophyly. But yeah, monophyly states that evolutionists predict that things will only come from their kind. That's what monophyly means. So it's what Kent keeps saying, dogs will come from dogs, is a kind of prediction that evolution has made before creationism did in the form of monophyly. So monophyly is like uh, organisms with multi multicellular organisms will come from multicellular organisms. And so everything is a multicellular organism or uh, all types of apes are descended from a certain kind of ape ancestor. So it's he's, he's not making a prediction. This is something evolution already knew. Uh, but I got two others if you got time. Yeah, did you post it in the private chat or are you? I was just gonna read it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Meliva says, hey Kent, your ridiculous $500 million lawsuit was dismissed. When are you going to apologize to Professor Dave? Well, I didn't understand a single syllable of that. Are you talking to me? Yeah. He said, well, Tom, uh, let's not get those kinds of questions in here okay. because, I mean, there were questions like that towards you, but I was respectable enough not to put them up. Oh, I'm, I'm fine with those on my end, just are for you? future okay. reference. So uh, we don't know if all the debaters are. So, yeah, just make sure, sure it's somewhat on topic. Go ahead. All right. So, Heather Lewis asks, why hasn't creationism changed the world? Nobel Prizes should be a part of your evidence and beating other religions. Donnie, I'm not seeing the question, and I can't understand a word he's saying. Can you put the question up? If, is he reading the question? I'm mm -hmm. not getting it. You can Possibly put it in the private chat if you uh, want, to, or uh, uh, Tom, or even in somehow. the... Um, I'm not sure if you have it saved. You can put it in the... I guess it's... well. 
Ken, it looks like Tom's also streaming the debate from his channel. So you're saying you're getting your own couple so, questions. Sir, you just want to repeat it for me. It says, why hasn't creationism changed the world? Nobel prizes should be a part of the evidence and beating oh. other religions. Okay. So how, how come the creation model is not getting any Nobel prizes and changing the world, I think is what it was. Oh, I'm not, I don't want a Nobel prize at all. I'm trying to change the world though. I think we're doing pretty good. It's upsetting, isn't it, Tom? Well, um, somehow uh, we made this debate last an hour and a half. So we're going to, I think, call it here. Uh, Kent and Tom, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, doing it. Well, it looks like a super chat just flew in. So I got to sneak it in here. So let's see. Tom, up to you if you want to answer this. So $10 super chat. Thank you. We're, guys, we're going to make this one the last one, though. So please, no more last minute questions, although I do appreciate it. So, Tom, why do we have fossils at all, if not from a global flood? Doesn't it take rapid burial and special conditions for fossilization? Go ahead. Well, global flood wouldn't do that, uh, but some fossilization takes rapid burial. Some doesn't. Um, there's other ways to do that, like volcanoes would produce rapid burial, ash clouds, rapid burial, tar pits. All those happen without a global flood. All right. Thank you. Kent, if there's well, anything wanted, you want to Donnie, I think it's logical. Any uh, freshman level detective would say, wow, this is evidence of a big flood when we find fossilized petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest. Wow. I bet Mount Everest was underwater at one time. Yeah. Uh, and the clams closed. I bet that means it got buried quickly before it had time to open. Yep. I think that's clear evidence. There was a rapid burial of trillions of clams and they're in the closed position. So I guess I don't understand how anybody can interpret that any differently. Uh, am I missing something here? Um, the clams died, so that's why they didn't open. And the sea floors collided because of the big tectonic plates, and so the mountain went up. It's pretty oh. simple. Pretty simple, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, there we go. We made it through the uh, Q&A and uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up here. So interesting one for sure. Why don't we have some final words, final thoughts, I guess. And then we're just going to we're going to shut down the debate. Um, Tom, we can start with you. Quick final words. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still waiting on novel tests. I, I want to know what if Kent can understand novel tests and predictions. Are they evidence and what creationism provides that's I'm really i was really looking forward to those it's really sad we didn't get any examples of those in the debate okay go ahead kent you get the last word and we're calling it go ahead i'm i'm still waiting for tom or anybody in the world to show me where's the evidence that ladybugs and whales are related they put a chart for the kids to believe this stuff where's the evidence for evolution i i say there's none i say cows have always made cows always will always did Dogs always made baby dogs, no exceptions. If Tom wishes to believe differently, that's fine, but that's why I wish the create I wish the evolutionists would admit they have a religion, it's not part of science. Evolution is not there's nothing scientific about it. It's a religious worldview, unrelated to science. Go ahead. All right. Well, Kent, Tom, that wraps up the debate on evidence for evolution, testable predictions to the audience. Thank you so much for your questions, your super chats, your super stickers. And we will see you tomorrow night for a debate on the Bible translation issue. Okay. Standing for Truth is out. Blessings all. <laughs>